Hi, I'm Dr. Ed Soltes. I'm a heart surgeon here at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm the Lewis Endowed Chair in Cardiothoracic Surgery, and also the Surgical Director of the Kaufman Center for Heart Failure and Recovery. Today, I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Anthony Zaki. Hi, good to meet you all. My name is Anthony Zaki, one of the staff cardiac surgeons here at the Cleveland Clinic as well. We're happy to join you today to answer some of your questions um, and provide you with this information. We wanted to focus today on complex, high-risk valve surgery, and particularly focused on some areas such as multi-valve surgery and reoperations. So I'd like to just begin, and, and Anthony, why might a patient be told they're high risk for valve surgery? Yes, this is something that we encounter quite a bit at the Cleveland Clinic. Patients come to us for an evaluation being told that they are quote unquote high risk, and that could be for several reasons. In general, we categorize risk into two categories, whether that's a for medical reasons or comorbidities or other medical issues that a patient may have, or surgical risk, whether they've had multiple surgeries in the past or whether they have some other technical factor that makes the surgery high risk. And the third category, which is part of their surgical risk, is how many procedures do they need done at once, whether it's an isolated valve or bypass or if it's a combination of multiple things. Um, so a lot of patients come to us with that labeling of high risk and I'd like to say that that oftentimes is a subjective labeling, and that varies center to center and surgeon to surgeon. We like to meet a patient for the first time, go through their medical complaints, go through their history, and kind of understand for ourselves what it truly is their risk level. What we realize is that for many patients, when they're told they're high risk um, in one particular center or program, may not necessarily be high risk at another program or it may be risk mitigation strategies uh, that may be available uh, at one program or another. And I think well, you know, one of the things we have seen here at the Cleveland Clinic are a lot of patients are declined surgery because they are considered too high risk. They're declined either because they have too many valves that need repair or replacement, that they have low ejection fraction, and there's a concern that they will not tolerate surgery. So Anthony, um, what are strategies we particularly use uh, to overcome uh, some of these issues? Well, the great thing about the Cleveland Clinic is we have access to several different tools, resources, tricks to get these type of patients successfully through an operation. So for example, if someone has been declined surgery at another center because their heart function is low, we have ways that we can support the heart through the operation, whether it's through a temporary heart pump um, or some other technique to get the heart through that vulnerable operation period and onto, and onto recovery. So that's just one example. People are declined for other risks as well, needing multiple valves repaired at once, having valve infections, or even having transcatheter valves that have been placed in the past that need to be removed or revised or taken care of. Dr. Zaki brings up a very good point, and one of those was uh, patients who've had TAVRs in the past. TAVRs obviously allow a minimally invasive uh, valve replacement, but of course, many times, uh, those uh, TAVR valves need to be removed. Either they're failing, they've become infected, or they are not uh, in the correct position they need to be in. So how, uh, tell me a little bit about removing a TAVR valve. If a patient's been told that they were high risk for heart surgery in the past and they had a TAVR, can they have a TAVR explant surgically? This is something we encounter all the time. Um, I just recently had a patient who said, well, if, if I had a TAVR a few years ago because surgery was too high risk, now that I need to have something done now, what has my surgical risk changed at all? And what I would say to that person is that the comfort level with TAVR removal, especially at a large center like Cleveland Clinic, has increased as the number of TAVR implants has increased. So if you go to a center that's comfortable removing and revising and repositioning TAVR valves, then that risk may is mitigated compared to the risk that you may have had up front. So TAVR is a wonderful technology and it um, is indicated for a lot of patients, but just because you've had a TAVR in the past doesn't mean that it can't be removed if it needs to be and a surgical option available to you. Yeah, that's very true. And I also think that one thing, a theme you've heard us talk about is having another opinion. And I think second opinions are absolutely critical, not only for patients with heart disease, but for all medical problems. I think receiving a special second opinion 
from a specialist is critical for everyone. And I advocate it for my patients, even who come to see me, um, but I think it's, it's, it's essential uh, for patients in their own decision-making as to what they want to do. Uh, Anthony, when you talk to patients, um, many times they've been to uh, other programs, they've seen other practitioners, they've come to see you for a second opinion. How do you uh, relate with them how some of the things that we do here can affect their recovery after surgery. Yeah, this is something, and I couldn't agree more with you, Dr. Soltes, about getting a second opinion and the importance of that. People are turned down for surgery for several different reasons by different, different providers. So the first thing I like to do when I meet someone who's been turned down at another center or by another surgeon is to try to understand why. So that involves taking a deep dive into the medical surgical history and talking to the patient and seeing what's going on and what are the conversations that they've had in the past. And that serves kind of as the starting point. And from there, I do my own assessment, I my own evaluation, and I try to get an understanding if those risks are truly prohibitive or if those risks that we can mitigate or somehow circumvent using some of the strategies and the resources that we have available here. Now, one of the things that we've heard uh, patients ask is, can all valves be addressed in a single operation. If you have multiple valves uh, that need repair or replacement, can they all be done at the same time? And obviously when we talk about transcatheter valve technology, uh, that is oftentimes not the case. But surgically, how, how do we deal with that surgically? Again, this is something that has become more of a topic recently with TAVR valves and transcatheter valves becoming more common. Um, the thought out there, which I don't necessarily agree with, is transcatheter approaches may address one valve and will just monitor the other valves. And what we see is that patients that may not correct all of their symptoms or all of their problems, and then they're referred to us or to the surgeons to say, well, I had one valve fixed with a transcatheter approach, but I have these other valves that are still leaking or still not functioning well, and I still have symptoms. I don't feel 100%. So what we can do surgically at the same time and in a single operation is address all of the valves at once. Um, whether a TAVR valve has been placed in the past or whether a mitra clip or any other transcatheter therapy has been used in the past, we not only can address that main valve or the valve that's already been addressed, but we can fix the other valves in the heart. And at the same time, we can do bypass surgery for coronary artery disease, and a lot of these patients with multi-valve disease have atrial fibrillation, so we can do surgical ablations to get people back into normal sinus rhythm at the same time as well. So whereas transcatheter technology is appropriate for many patients, people with multi-valve disease, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, open heart surgery can address all of these concerns in a single shot. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and especially is the case with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a growing problem in the U.S. and worldwide, and we know it's been associated with a lot of comorbidity. We are able at the time of a surgical operation, whether it be the primary operation or even a reoperation, to perform an extremely durable ablation that has a tremendously high success rates of getting patients out of atrial fibrillation and in sinus rhythm which reduces not only their risk of stroke long-term, uh, but reduces their risk of long-term heart failure, uh, dementia, and many other comorbidities that uh, we have seen associated with atrial fibrillation. Uh, Anthony, I recently saw that you had done a fourth time reoperation on someone, someone who had had three previous heart surgeries. So can you tell me a little bit about how previous heart surgeries affect your ability to operate? I think there are many patients out there who are erroneously told that they've had too many heart surgeries, that so, quote unquote, we can't go back in a fourth or fifth time. Can you, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, this is something that we encounter quite a bit. Patients who have had val valve disease or heart disease throughout their lifetime may or have experienced multiple open heart surgeries. And whereas it is true that the second operation and the third operation, there is scar tissue, what we've learned in our experience here is that Oftentimes, reoperation is just as safe as the first operation, whether that's the second, third, or fourth time. And that's only true at centers that have that experience. So we're grateful and we're happy to be here at the Cleveland Clinic where we have that experience and we have that skill and that knowledge that's been passed down 
from mentors of, of mine, like Dr. Soltes, who have kind of passed on this understanding of how to deal with these read operations. I think that adage of we've been in there too many times, we can't go back. It should be tested or it should be checked with a second opinion. And may that may or may not be absolutely true. Yeah, very true. And, and I think one of the things we've heard repeatedly uh, is this idea of uh, team-based care. We all work together. We learn from one another. We have a very close connection with our cardiology colleagues. We have conferences together where we review high-risk patients. We have conferences within our surgical staff where we review complex uh, operations. So I think one of the advantages of the Cleveland Clinic is just that. It is a true team of teams approach to treating patients. But I also think on an individual level for a patient, it's important for us to be able to engage in a shared decision-making with our patients so that they understand uh, what we can offer, and we understand what they want for as their quality of life, their survival, their risk tolerance. So, you know, last question, uh, Anthony, is when you talk with patients in the clinic, what does the conversation sound like? The first thing I understand when meeting with a patient is that they've been through a long process before they've gotten to me. They've been through either a primary care, a cardiologist, and perhaps have been through several different centers until coming to me. And often I feel like the most important step is to hear from them what have they been through, what have they been told, and often what are their expectations. And that, that serves as a good starting point for me. And from there, I do my own evaluation and my own assessment uh, within our team approach that Dr. Soltes described. And then from there, we make a plan. And like Dr. Soltes mentioned, not every patient is the same and not every valve disease is the same. And so a discussion with the patient about what are you looking for? What are your goals? What are your values? What are you expecting from your treatment plan? It really helps guide the discussion and together we come up with a, the best solution possible. Well, we're gonna close now, but I just wanna ask for one final comment, one recommendation for patients uh, sure. from, from your experience uh, as a staff Cleveland Clinic heart surgeon. And this is something I tell family and friends who have medical issues. Um, is ask questions, get a second opinion, and move forward when you're comfortable. Excellent. And it's important to recognize that as a patient, you have control of your health. And it is in your best interests to ask questions as you just heard, get a second opinion, and then make a informed decision with your family, with your practitioners, um, as to exactly how to proceed. Thank you very much for listening today. We're excited to be able to share some of our practice here at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit parkvalvesurgery.com.